I do understand that all discovery has been exchanged in this case. It has been fully pre-tried. Um, in fact, the case was set for trial to begin today, uh, but a plea agreement has been reached. And who would like to place that plea agreement um, on the record for the state of Ohio? Your Honor, uh, at this time, the state's understanding is that the defendant will be withdrawing his previously entered plea of not guilty and entering a plea of no contest to the indictment uh, with no amendments. Uh, no threats, promises, or inducements have been made, and there are no other conditions of the plea other than what uh, I have just stated on the record. All right, thank you, Mr. Schroeder. Mr. Patitus. Uh Thank you, Your Honor. On behalf of Mr. Skull and I, have reviewed with him, as has uh, Amigo Patitus and Carlos Sicharo, uh, all of my clients rule 11 rights. I have explained to him his right to go to trial, his right to call witnesses. At this time, he would like to relieve the government of the need to prove each and every element of the crime charged by pleading no contest rather than guilty. Uh, I have informed my client uh, of our conversations that the government, myself, and the court have had in chambers that the court will be sentencing him, obviously, to a life term of incarceration. Uh, however, he will, will be looking at a release, potential release from prison in the 28 to 36 year range following sentencing. Uh, aside from that, no other threats or promises have been uh, made, and I believe my client will be entering a knowing change of plea from not guilty to no contest. All right, thank you, Mr. Patitus. And Mr. Scullin, if you have any questions at any time throughout these proceedings, please don't hesitate to let me know because I will give you the opportunity to speak with your lawyer, okay? Yes, ma'am. Also, before I advise you of your rights, I do have several questions for you. Please make sure that you answer my questions out loud and loudly enough so that both our court reporter and I can hear you, okay? Yes. Please state your name and age. Jeffrey William Scullin, Jr., uh, 21. And did you understand what was just stated on the record? Yes, ma'am. Do you have a high school diploma, GED, or other degree? Uh, no. What's the last grade in school that you completed? Uh, I don't know. Are you able to read and write the English language? Yes. Are you a United States citizen? Yes. Within the last 24 hours, have you consumed any drugs, alcohol, or medication? No, ma'am. During the last 24 hours, have you failed to take medication that is prescribed for you? No. Are you suffering from any mental or physical disability? No. Are you thinking clearly here today? Yes. Are you currently on supervision in any jurisdiction for probation, community control sanctions, parole, or post-release control? No. Has anyone threatened you to enter this plea of no contest? No. Has anyone promised you anything special if you enter your plea other than what was stated on the record by your counsel? And are you entering into this plea voluntarily? Yes. Have you had enough time with your lawyers? Yes. Are you satisfied with the representation that you have received from them? Yes. Do you understand the allegations contained in the indictment? Yes. <clears throat> and do you understand that if you plead no contest, that um, the court may then, after hearing a recitation of the facts from the state of Ohio, uh, find you guilty of the charges to which you plead no contest? Yes. All right. Now, Mr. Scullin, you have rights afforded to you by the state of Ohio and the United States Constitutions. I am about to advise you of those rights. Again, don't hesitate to let me know if you have any questions, okay? Do you understand that you have the right to a trial by jury of 12 persons? Yes. Do you understand that the verdict of the jury must be unanimous or that they must all agree on a guilty verdict? Yes. Do you understand that you may waive or give up your right to a jury trial and have your case tried to this court? Yes. Do you understand that you have the right to a speedy trial? Yes. Do you understand that at trial, the state of Ohio has the obligation or burden of proving your guilt by evidence beyond a reasonable doubt as to each element of each crime of which you have been charged? Yes. Do you understand that you, through counsel, have the right to confront or cross-examine any witness who would testify against you at trial? Yes. Do you understand that you have the right to compulsory process, which means you have the right to subpoena witnesses or demand their attendance at trial if you would present a defense at trial? Do you understand that you cannot be forced or compelled to testify against yourself at trial? Yes. Do you understand that if you would choose or elect 
not to testify at trial, that your silence could not be used against you in any attempt to prove your guilt. Yes. Do you understand that you have the right to counsel, and if you cannot afford counsel, you will be provided counsel at no cost to you? Yes. And do you understand that if you plead no contest, that you are waiving all of your important constitutional rights. Yes. All right. Mr. Scullin, you are expected to plead no contest to the following charges, specifically every count of the indictment. Count one is aggravated murder in violation of section 2903.01a, that's an unspecified felony. Under Ohio law, the potential penalties are life, imprisonment with the possibility of parole after 20 years, life imprisonment with the possibility of parole after 25 years, life imprisonment with the possibility of parole after 30 years, or life with possibility, I'm sorry, life with no possibility of parole. Do you understand that? Yes. And you're also then expected to plead guilty, I'm sorry, expected to plead no contest to the one-year firearm specification and the three-year firearm specification under that count. Now, those two firearm specifications would merge for purposes of sentencing, uh, but nonetheless then, that would include then a three-year firearm specification and the three years must be served prior to and consecutive to any time imposed for the underlying felony. Do you understand that? Yes. All right. Now, with regard to count two, that you're also expected to plead no contest to, that is murder, again, an unspecified felony, and that is punishable by a prison term of basically 15 years to life. Do you understand that? And then there's the one-year, three-year firearm specification under that count as well. They, too, would merge, but nonetheless, the three years would be served prior to and consecutive to any time imposed for the underlying offense. Do you understand that? Yes. And then with regard to count three, although the murder charge would, would merge with the aggravated murder. You would agree with that, Mr. Schroeder? Yes, sir. And you, Mr. Panatus, as well? Absolutely. I'm just giving you all the potential penalties associated with each of the counts so you understand, okay? All right, now you're also expected to plead no contest to count three, that's felonious assault, and that's a felony of the second degree. <clears throat> a felony of the second degree is punishable by a prison term of two to eight years in yearly increments. A fine of up to $15,000 in post-release control is mandatory for a period of three years, and there are one year and three year firearm specifications under that count. Again, those would merge. Um, three years would be served prior to and consecutive to any time imposed for the underlying uh, felonious assault count. But again, the felonious assault charge would merge with the um, aggravated murder, correct? Yes, sir. You agree, Mr. Panatus? Yes, sir. All right. And the same thing with regard to count four, that's felonious assault as well, a felony of the second degree. I've already described the potential penalties associated with a felony of the second degree as well as those two firearm specifications under that count. But again, that would merge as well with count one. Do you understand that? Yes. All right. And finally, count five, that you're expected to plead no contest to, that's tampering with evidence. That's a felony of the third degree. This would not merge with any of the other counts. And this felony of the third degree is punishable by a prison term of 9, 12, 18, 24, 30, or 36 months, a fine of up to $10,000, and um, there's no presumption in favor of or against prison for a felony of the third degree. But if prison's imposed, there's a discretionary period of post-release control of up to three years. Do you understand that, sir? And with regard to count six, making false alarms, that's a misdemeanor of the first degree, as is count seven, endangering children. Uh, a misdemeanor of the first degree is punishable by, a, punishable by a period of local incarceration of up to 180 days and a fine of up to $1,000. So understand that, sir. Yes. And also, there's a potential fine for count one, the aggravated murder count, and I believe that's up to $25,000. Yes, sir. Do you understand that, sir? Yes. All right. Now, with regard to the felony of the third degree, the tampering with evidence, do you understand that uh, if prison is imposed, you may have to serve a period of post-release control as part of your sentence after release from prison, and this would be discretionary or optional on the part of the adult parole authority, it could be for up to three years. And do you understand that if or when you are placed on post-release control, the adult parole authority is authorized to return you to prison for up to nine months for any single violation, up to a maximum of 50% of your prison sentence for all violations. Yes. And do you understand that if you're convicted of a new felony while on post-release control, that in addition to being punished for the new offense, 
the court could add an additional consecutive prison term of one year or what time remains on your post-release control term, whichever is greater as a maximum penalty. Yes. All right. And you understand that the court also can impose upon you court costs and require the payment of any restitution, supervision fees, and or costs of confinement. Yes. All right. Um, Mr. Scullin. <clears throat> Do you understand, in general, that by pleading no contest to all of these offenses, that you are not admitting your guilt, but you are admitting the truth of the facts as alleged in the indictment? All right. <clears throat> now, what would like the state like to say for purposes of the no contest plea to put the factual basis on the record? Thank you, Your Honor. Had this case proceeded to trial, the state would have presented evidence that on the afternoon of October the 23rd, 2017, Melinda Pleskovic, the victim in this case, was murdered while inside her home in Strongsville, Cuyahoga County, Ohio. Ms. Pleskovic was shot three times and stabbed 36 or 37 times. The evidence would have shown that around 8 o'clock p.m. that night, the victim's husband, Bruce, arrived home to find her body. Also with Bruce was the defendant in this case, Jeffrey Scullin, who was engaged to Ms. Pleskovic's daughter, Anna. The evidence would have shown that police responded to the scene and obtained a search warrant for the Chevy Silverado truck that the defendant was driving on that night. That search yielded a knife in the back seat of the truck. A field test of the knife showed human blood on the blade and subsequent DNA testing of that knife revealed both the defendant's DNA on the handle and the victim's blood on the blade. At that time, Detective Stoltz obtained an arrest warrant for the defendant. He was arrested at the Strongsville Police Department on October the 31st, 2017. During questioning that night and again the following day, he gave a full confession to killing Melinda Pleskovic on the night of October the 23rd. The defendant also told the police the location of the second murder weapon, which was a 357 caliber revolver. He told police that he had put the revolver inside a black backpack that was inside a Buick LeSabre that he was driving during that week and that was present in the driveway of his parents' home at the time. He signed a written consent form authorizing police to search that Buick LeSabre, which they did, and discovered the black backpack in the backseat area containing the 357 revolver. Subsequent DNA testing on the revolver showed the defendant's DNA on the handle of that gun. Subsequent ballistics testing of that gun showed that the gun was a match to the bullets that were fired at the crime scene. And also inside the back seat of the car were the clothes that the defendant was wearing on the night of the murder that were stained with the victim's blood. With respect to the tampering with evidence count, the evidence would have shown that Detective Stoltz had previously examined the interior of the Buick LeSabre on October the 27th. At that time, the vehicle was empty and the black backpack and the gun and the clothes were not there. And this means the defendant hid those items inside the LeSabre at some point between October the 27th and October the 31st. GPS data from the defendant's cell phone showed that he was in the vicinity of the Pleskovic home until 5.37 p.m. on the day of the murder. At that time, the GPS data showed the defendant's phone moving from the Pleskovic home to head west on Drake Road towards the home of his aunt. The phone did not ping to the cell tower nearest his aunt's home until between 5.55 and 6.22 p.m. And this contradicted the defendant's initial statement to police that he left for his aunt's home shortly after 3 o'clock. The evidence would have shown that the defendant did told police that his car broke down on the way to his aunt's home. He claimed that he stopped at a get-go gas station on Drake and Pearl Roads and got $6 worth of gas from a good Samaritan. Detective Stoltz reviewed surveillance video from that get-go gas station and learned that the defendant was never there on that day. Additionally, the defendant's aunt said that he did not arrive at her home until 6 o'clock, which would have contradicted the defendant's claim that he arrived around 4.30. The evidence would have shown that the defendant kept both guns and knives inside the home, the Pleskovic home where he lived, but that the particular weapons that he used to kill Melinda Pleskovic were kept in the basement. Ms. Pleskovic was killed in the kitchen on the ground floor of her home, so the defendant would have had to go to the basement to retrieve those weapons and bring them back to the kitchen to commit the murder. 
The evidence would have shown with respect to the making false alarms count that on October the 19th of 2017, the defendant called 911 and made a false report that someone had tried to break into the Pleskovic home. He said that he heard a noise coming from the sliding glass door at the back of the home and saw a hand reaching inside of the door. He said that the dog, Moose, ran to the door. He said that he opened the sliding glass door and saw a man running away through the backyard. He said that the man became caught on the dog leash on the patio and knocked down all of the lawn chairs as he fled. He described the man as wearing black mesh sweatpants with white stripes and a blue Hollister hoodie. Detective Stoltz also reviewed surveillance footage from a camera on a nearby structure that was pointed at the back of the Pleskovic home, and that video revealed that no one came to the back door on October the 19th, and the incident that the defendant described simply never occurred. This would have been relevant to show not only the count of making false alarms, it also would have been relevant to show the existence of prior calculation and design with respect to count one. Bruce Pleskovic, when he called 911 upon finding his wife's body, referenced burglaries in the area as who he believed initially committed the murder. Bruce told police in subsequent interviews that people had been breaking into the home, stealing money, stealing things from his car, stealing car keys, setting off car alarms in the driveway, and that all these things started happening when the defendant moved into the house. The evidence would have shown that this was a part, pattern of pre-planned behavior by the defendant to make people think that there was a rash of burglaries in the neighborhood weeks in advance of the murder. Finally, the evidence would have shown that the defendant was engaged to the victim's daughter, Anna Pleskovic. They were supposed to get married on Saturday, October the 28th, five days after the murder, at the Skyview Lodge at Brunswick. The defendant's credit card was declined 14 times in terms of paying for that venue. So the Skyview Lodge sent an email to Melinda Pleskovic on October the 18th saying that they were going to have to cancel the wedding because the defendant had not paid for the venue. Anna Pleskovic called the Skyview Lodge that same day and said that the defendant and his mother were coming to the Skyview Lodge on October the 22nd, the day before the murder, to pay for the wedding. That did not happen, and the evidence would have shown that Melinda intended to confront the defendant about that fact that particular weekend. Finally, with respect to the, uh, sorry, the child endangering count, the evidence would have shown that the defendant's 15-month-old daughter was present with him at the home when he committed the murder by firing three gunshots at Melinda in close quarters, and that this recklessly created a substantial risk to that child's safety. Thank you. Thank you. I should say, Mr. Scullin, do you understand the penalties you face by entering your no contest plea, assuming I find you guilty? Do you understand the penalties? Yes. All right. And do you have any questions about the penalties? No. Do you have any questions about these proceedings? No. Counsel, has the court complied with criminal rule 11? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, Your Honor, only just one clarification. I know you asked him if he acknowledged that he was waiving his constitutional rights. He still is making his appellate rights. Pers yes, Pers that's Pers absolutely true. You so understand sure. that, sir? Okay. Mr. Scullin, you will have appellate rights associated with the decision on the motion to suppress. You understand that? Yes. All right. Um, the record should reflect then that the court is satisfied that the defendant, Mr. Scullin, has been informed of his constitutional rights, that he understands the nature of the charges, the effect of his plea, and the maximum penalties that may be imposed. The court further finds that the defendant's plea will be made knowingly, intelligently, and voluntarily. Mr. Scullin, understanding everything that I have laid out, how do you plead to count one, aggravated murder, an unspecified felony? And how do you plead to the one-year firearm specification under that count? No contest. How do you plead to the three-year firearm specification under that count? No contest. And how do you plead to count two, murder, also an unspecified felony? No contest. And how do you plead to the one-year firearm specification under that count? No contest. How do you plead to the three-year firearm specification under count two? No contest. And how do you plead to count three, felonious assault, a felony of the second degree? No contest. How do you plead to the one-year firearm specification under that count? How do you plead to the three-year firearm specification under that count? No contest. And how do you plead to count four felonious assault, a felony of the second degree? No contest. And how do you plead to the one-year firearm specification under count four? No contest. How do you plead to the three-year firearm specification under count four? No contest. And how do you plead to count five tampering with evidence, a felony of the third degree? No contest. And how do you plead to the forfeiture of a weapon specification contained thereunder? 
And how do you plead to count six making false alarms a misdemeanor of the first degree? And how do you plead to count seven endangering children also a misdemeanor of the first degree? Thank you. The court accepts your plea, but based upon the information stated on the record that the state uh, was prepared to uh, prove at, at trial, the court does find you guilty on all of those counts, including the firearm specifications. And um, in that regard, then, we'll set this matter for sentencing, and I'll give you your appellate rights as well. But the sentencing in this matter will be set for October 29, 2018, at 10 o'clock a.m., and you're requesting a PSI, correct, Mr. Patitus? Yes, Your Honor, that's correct. All right. And uh, the matter will be referred to the probation department for an expedited pre-sentence investigation report. The state of Ohio is ordered to notify the name, the victim's family of the date and time of sentencing at that time. <clears throat> and otherwise, I will <coughs> read you your appellate rights at the time of the sentencing. Do you understand that, Mr. Spellman? Yes, ma'am. All right. Anything further, Mr. Schroeder? No, Your Honor. Anything further, Mr. Patitus? No, Your Honor. Thank you. All right. The defendant is remanded pending sentencing on October 29th. Thank, Thank you. you all. Thank you, Judge.